phone? Yes, it's on me. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's get started. And the plan for today's lesson is to talk a little bit about sources. Uh, and as I said, tomorrow uh, I'll be talking about more recent stuff uh, related particularly to my own interests, which are uh, the search for Kilonovi and um, which are the electromagnetic counterpart of uh, binary neutral thumb measurement. <coughs> so I wanted to show this because I thought it was a nice animation. Probably most of you saw it. I mean, it's been around for a long time. Just show the ring of particles, but not only one, but uh, you know, several in a line in the same direction in which the wave travels. And it, it's showing how the wave is, as it passes by, stretching and elongating the, the rings of particles. So when I talk about sources, I'm going to concentrate with only on just some particular uh, type of sources. We are uh, the ones relevant to LIGO and VIGO and the terrestrial interferometer. So actually the gravitational wave spectrum covers all the possible range up to, you know, the length of uh, the Hubble scale, the length of the universe. And, um, you know, very, very, very low frequencies. So you have very, very low frequencies and high frequencies here. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale, so you can see that uh, about uh, 100 hertz is here, and the rest of the parameters speak about 150 um, hertz, but they, depending on the, on, on which uh, incarnation of the interferometer you're using that minimizes the seismic noise, you can get up to 30 or even lower uh, hertz. I forgot now the proposed Einstein telescope. I think it's going to try to go even a bit lower than that. And, um, and it goes up to uh, kilohertz, where the peak of sensitivity, when you look at the noise curve, you probably, in your data analysis classes, have been looking at, uh, at, that, at that noise curve. Um, the highest sensitivity is around 150 uh, hertz. So this is the region of millihertz where you have uh, space interferometers like LISA could uh, be very useful and um, in uh, frequencies even lower than that then uh, one possibility is using pulsars and getting an array of several of them uh, that are going to work uh, like a very long baseline interferometer and uh, but, but they're good only for certain type of sources and and then um, you know much lower than that. Uh, uh, one possible thing is is to look at the polarization of the cosmic microwave background, and which that's essentially what uh, several missions, uh, starting with Planck, uh, uh, have started doing and trying to infer uh, things about uh, the possible presence of. Uh, gravitational waves, although these are indirect, not very, uh, it's a matter of debate, I guess, but I wouldn't call it direct detection because it's an imprint. On it's like looking at fossils and inferring things about the dinosaurs. At least that's my take on it. So I'm going to concentrate on this, on the terrestrial interferometer. If the source is there, uh, as probably all of you already know, uh, Holy Grail, binary neutron stars, uh, systems, but it could be um, a neutron star and a black hole, or two black holes, which seems to be uh, the one um, for which uh, nature has been uh, more generous in, in giving us the chance to see. 
the other possible source. So what is interesting about the, the binary systems, I'm going to cover a little bit of, of uh, binary systems, but um, I'm not going to go, uh, they, you know, in, in, in one week, there's no way to do that. A very important thing is what is called the post Newtonian approximation because it's, that's the one that gives you exactly exact shapes to um, as you want waveform templates depending on the ratio of the masses, the mass chirp, and, uh, and the distance to from the source to uh, the observer. Um, so this post Newtonian uh, approximation is extremely useful and necessary to make gravitational wave detection. One of the biggest things, and probably in, in your course of uh, data analysis that, that was mentioned, uh, detecting a gravitational wave is extremely difficult because they're very weak. We, we saw a few examples yesterday. So you don't need to know nuclear physics to detect the sun. You know, the noise to signal, uh, the signal to noise ratio of the sun is so huge that there's no doubt that it's something there. In, in the case of uh, gravitational waves, signal to noise ratio, uh, you really need to use very powerful techniques. One way, um, as you probably learned already in, in the data analysis part of this workshop, is to use templates. Uh, and, and the templates can be extremely useful in, in this show the way you're detecting and extracting parameters. And extracting parameters is probably one of the most important things you're going to do after saying that you detected a wave, understanding um, what the characteristics of the source are. So I'm only going to talk about binary system, but up to um, going into post-Newtonian uh, ex expansion and not even touching on, on numerical velocity. But um, the other source are supernova explosions. This are treated like a model bursts because we really don't have templates uh, that we can use for modeling uh, these explosions. There are several techniques and methods, and probably in, in, in data analysis you have studied that, but from the point of view of studying the dynamics of gravitational wave emission in, in supernovae, uh, I'm not going to say anything because we really don't know much about that. And um, the other sources are going to be, so I'm going to talk about binary systems. But the other source that is interesting is pulsars uh, or neutron stars. And so if they happen to be elliptical, this, of course, is a tremendous exaggeration. Uh, they're going to have a net quadrupolar moment that is changing with time. So it's accelerated, and it's going to be a source of gravitational waves. That could be uh, just the fact that this is not a perfect sphere, but more an ellipsoid. Um, or it could be that it has tiny mountains, or it could be that uh, the fluid inside, the, you know, behind the, the crust of... Um, of the neutron star has vibrational modes that also are going to be rise to an, a net quadrupolar moment that is different from zero, and it's also going to be a source of gravitational waves. And finally, the other source I'm going to be talking about is the, st the stochastic cosmological uh, background of gravitational waves. They could be a stochastic and isotropic background of many sources, like uh, you know popcorn when you put those bags in uh, in a microwave oven and it started exploding at this sort of popcorn noise. Uh, you could have so many sources um, in the universe that are actually emitting gravitational waves because there are uh, mergers happening all everywhere that give, uh, could give rise to also a stochastic background of that nature. But I'm going to only focus and concentrate on 
a stochastic background uh, that could have been originated in the Big Bang itself. Th this is particularly interesting because what we know of the Big Bang are inferences that we take from this time, which is a little bit less than 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And with this, as uh, we're going to see, we can look into pretty much almost a blank scale in time. And that means going back up to almost the moment of the big explosion. And that's one of the reasons why uh, this type of gravitational waves, if we can ever detect them, uh, could be of tremendous interest. So my decent slides is stop here. And I'm going to use the notes for um, the course that I gave. I think you can, with some effort, read a little bit there, right? And so it's all handwritten, I'm sorry. And um, I, you know, just a year ago, I, I at the University of Buenos Aires, I gave a course on this, and I might be some leftovers in in Spanish words uh, here and there. Hopefully, not too many. Um, so the first thing I want to do is to transform from a um, transverse list, uh, transverse trace list gauge to a local inertial system of reference. So we're going to start with that metric that essentially is Minkowski plus these two functions, H plus, um, and here and here. So assuming one particular polarization. And um, so essentially, the I want to go to a prime metric that can be written like um, the Minkowski metric plus orders of uh, the curvature uh, and second uh, order in the coordinates. So the components so far are going to be h double dot here and um, plus orders of uh, the um, distance squared. And but we're going to pick up these null coordinates that remember they were very useful to look at plane waves. So using u and v, the null coordinates, uh, the metric is going to change the dt and dz factor like this, and z is, is going to be the direction of propagation. So we can rewrite the metric like this. I'm going to rush a little bit because I'm not going to be adding any more content to what uh, I introduced uh, yesterday when, when I went into the um, transverse traceless gauge. So x and y are going to be like this. And uh, we uh, can write in prime coordinates where dx and dy are remain functions of x prime and y prime and orders of h square. We can write it like this. The metric then is going to be written like this. Notice that there, uh, there are second order terms in, in the perturbation. And so essentially, we're going to get the wave equation for the Riemann tensor. Um, of course, we expect it to satisfy the Bianchi identities, which essentially reduces to this. We can contract um, in the alpha and lambda indices and using that the uh, Ricci tensor is equal to zero. Uh, we get this, where this is a divergence, and we get essentially a wave equation for the Riemann tensor. Eventually, I want to use this even for non-Einstein theories of gravity. That's the, uh, the one part I'm going to add uh, to what I said yesterday. So um, let's look at gravitational wave propagation in a curved space-time. So we need to separate the perturbation from the background. Uh, let's assume it's small amplitude, so the wavelength is going to be much smaller than the curvature. And have a description of a gravitational wave with uh, R0 uh, will still be valid in an inertial system. 
but uh, we're looking at the limit of the short wavelength, so the geometric wave uh, reverse trace perturbation limit. So we're going to write uh, this metric perturbation this way, and um, and we're going to get a, uh, a background metric that is actually this G0, and, and this is the perturbation. So H is the contraction between both. So one thing I remember, Einstein's equations for the metric perturbation, uh, we're going to apply, we're going to still work in the Lorentz gauge, and we get this equation plus orders of uh, uh, the curvature square, or one of the curvature square, and the amplitude of the perturbation can be given by this. So this is what's called the curved Lorentz gauge, and we're going to assume now um, that the metric perturbation can be written in terms of uh, um, tensorial amplitude and phase. And we assume that this A changes slow, but the phase fast. And um, so we're going to have a, a wave number that is going to be given by this derivative, uh, which is proportional to one of the wavelengths. And of course, this still we're going to get um, uh, that uh, this, this contraction is equal to zero, and we can use the wave equation in a, a curved space time, write it like this. The obviously, the waves are going to be null, so they're going to be moving uh, through uh, space time geodesics of the, of the curved space time. They're going to satisfy the geodesic equation, and we can write that A alpha beta. So amplitude is actually a scalar amplitude times something uh, that is essentially a polarization tensor. Uh, if we do calculate the contraction, which you, you see that is, is 2. And, um, and it's going to follow that uh, the polarization tensor and the amplitude satisfies this equation. We can contract now with this. And we're going to observe that it's, I get these two equations. First, this one for the polarization tensor. And, and then for the projection of polarization tensor, this other equation. So the first one is like a current conservation equation. And the second one uh, shows that the polarization tensor is parallelly transported along null geodesic. Before looking now at uh, generalized uh, wave solutions that go beyond Einstein theory, uh, one thing worth taking a look at, uh, a look at is, is, is the, the attenuation effect. So let's assume the gravitational wave encounters a, a viscous uh, fluid, assume that it's at rest, and then uh, we're going to have a shearing that is given by this um, equation. We define here in this way. And in the TT gauge, the gravitational wave effect is going to be spatial, purely spatial. It's going to be given by this uh, value. And this is going to contribute to the energy momentum tensor of viscosity that is equal like this. So th this quantity times this, which is uh, the viscosity of the fluid in question. So the associated weak field equations are going to become this. So I have now like an, an effective tensor. Um, and this is going to produce a wave attenuation that is of the form e to the minus z l. Remember z is the direction of propagation. And l is the attenuation length scale that is inversely proportional to the viscosity of the medium. So for a gas with molecule with mass m, uh, velocity v, and interaction cross-section that is going to be given uh, inversely proportional to the viscosity. We're going to get a mean free path that is uh, of the order 1 over uh, n sigma, where n is the number density of molecules. And of course, n times m is the mass density of the fluid. So eta is going to be proportional to rho vd, and rho is nf. 
and um, so the lens is going to become uh, this, which now using the the curvature is equal to uh, c over the square root of a pi g. The density can be written in terms of the curvature um, over the um, the, the d parameter times c over b. So in the short wavelength approximation where the curvature is much larger than the wavelength and the wavelength is much larger than d and d is much smaller than c, we get that L is much larger than the curvature. So the attenuation scale is greater than the curvature scale. Now, what I wanted to look is at the properties uh, of uh, the wave equation that uh, we have described and, and can be used, for example, to discover uh, gravitational radiation through a particular medium. So uh, if we look at the geodesic deviation equation, of course, we, we, can, uh, we, we can write the vector like this. The relative acceleration of the particles that are going to be given by this, where this is the curvature, and essentially A1 is going to be this quantity. A2 is going to be this quantity, proportional to the both plus and cross polarization. And we can look at two particles. The perturbation happens uh, at the perpendicular direction. Uh, and the wave, which is going to obey these equations, and uh, with this particular uh, positions, and we can see the plus polarization and the cross polarization. But this is the same that we saw before now in, in, in this same context. But um, so if we define a univector uh, in the direction of separation of the geodesics, the through which the particles move, then we have this component in the geodesic deviation h theta that is proportional to the curvature and that uh, gives me the, the, the behavior of, of this component. And uh, if we assume a zero initial velocity, then theta is going to be given by this. Assuming theta is pi over 2, then the separation vector is in the plane transversal to z. Now, what we're going to do now is look at this uh, um, curvatures that, curvature, sorry, at uh, these waves that represent solutions of the wave equation for the Riemann tensor and assume that we have a theory that is Riemannian or pseudo Riemannian in nature, as a metric theory, but not necessarily Einstein. In other words, this solution does not necessarily satisfy Einstein's equation. It does satisfy that the Riemann obeys, uh, the Riemann tensor obeys the wave equation. So we're going to assume um, a Riemann tensor of this shape. We're going to make it obey the Bianchi identity. And now with this particular indices, 0, 1, and 2, uh, we get uh, the 1, 2, uh, delta epsilon component constant and zero. And the, if we use the anti-symmetry in the first two indices, it, then we can write it like this. This is also zero. This is also zero. And now choosing alpha zero, beta one, and gamma three, and we can calculate this. It's going to be minus c or one over c times one z the, the one zero delta e component of the Riemann tensor plus c over t, and that also uh, goes to zero, and uh, we're going to get that this component is proportional to this other one, and essentially we get this equation surviving. Uh, the the change in the z direction, the propagation direction, is minus one over c. Uh, the change is just this component in uh, respect to the other time. So we can write then the Riemann tensor again in terms of a polarization tensor like in the previous uh, Einstein case. 
So these are the only components of the Riemann tensor. Again, no Einstein. And we have six independent components. This means that we have six independent polarizations possible. The first one, let's look at X3, and that means the direction of propagation, and this will be the plane X2. So this is sort of uh, symmetric. If we have a sphere of particles, now it's going to contract in like a sphere of particles. It's going to contract like um, uh, an ellipsoid. So it's a three-dimensional version of the ellipse that we have before. So we have a longitudinal polarization. This is only E33 is zero. That's the case. That's the spin zero. Then we have a spin one, which corresponds to um, uh, E31 over three E32 surviving. This is X1 and also X2 and X3. So this is just the 45 degrees rotation of the previous case. So E32 uh, is equal to E23 is different from zero. E31 is equal to E13 is different from zero. And if E11 is equal to E22, then what we get is spin zero transverse. Notice it's this X2 and X1. This is called a breathing mode because you get a sphere that grows uh, like a sphere. So it doesn't go into an ellipse, it's, uh, a sphere, sorry. That's the, the ring of particles is going to go into a larger ring. So obviously this is a mode uh, like the previous one that we don't find in uh, Einstein theory. Then there's a spin 2 transverse in the x2, x1 uh, that is essentially a plus polarization. And a spin two transversal, so it's like the cross polarization. So those are very nice things. And of course, if we make the Riemann tensor of A Einstein's equations, essentially the longitudinal modes disappear. So y we only get the plus and cross polarization. And People that are interested in looking at alternative theories of gravity actually look at the possibility of being able to detect all these polarizations uh, when searching for gravitational waves. So let's take a look at the energy transported by gravitational wave. I already mentioned that uh, we can now have a global concept of energy in gravitational waves. Um, and um, but we can transform to a reference system. But I mean, it, but, but very important concept. In the 30s, the few people that, work in, that were working in general relativity discussed a lot about the existence, the reality of, of energy associated with the gravitational field. So if the gravitational waves in particular would carry energy, or wouldn't carry energy, because they were more like a mathematical uh, oddity coming out of uh, Einstein's equations and the true reality. And separately, uh, Bondi and, and Feynman proposed the following thought experiment. Think about the, um, the particles um, that are um, moving apart because of the passage of gravitation away perpendicular to where the two particles are. Now, if think that these particles are beads, so they have um, a hole in the middle, and you join them with a bar. And in principle, the particles can slide along the bar. And if your gravitational wave passes by, then the beads are going to be moving like the free falling particles. They just have a constraint. They're still free falling particles. They have that constraint. But that means they're moving through the bar. Uh, friction is going to heat up the bar. If that got to happen, because we are thinking about a realistic bar, and that means that there's energy because the energy that, is that you can measure with the heat that is evidenced in the bar can only come from the gravitational wave that was the cause of motion. 
So this is a famous experiment that was thought first by Bondi, uh, but Feynman uh, independently have a similar thought. I don't remember if the experiment was exactly similar, but the idea was the same. So what we want to do is be able to somehow calculate that energy that is being transported by the gravitational wave. <coughs> so the idea is to transform to a reference system, inertial reference system, which the field is zero locally. And so we want to calculate a region where uh, the typical length is much, uh, much larger than the wavelength of the wave, but at the same time, this typical length is uh, much smaller than the curvature. And uh, so Einstein's equations can be written like this. And uh, the, the, the different terms of the Einstein tensor in doing an expansion. And G alpha beta, of course, is um, Minkowski plus a perturbation. So uh, G alpha beta is just Minkowski, but then G1 alpha beta, G2, are they are ordered H, H squared, and so on and so forth. And uh, so we can write it like this. And we can write uh, that the Einstein's equations in vacuum are like this. We need the Einstein equations in vacuum because we are far from the source. We're not assuming now uh, curved space time. And so to first order, we have this equation, and then we can uh, also look at this other order. And um, so the terms are like uh, an effective energy momentum tensor for two. Mm? So notice what I'm doing here. Uh, this is G1 in, in H2. So G alpha of the second order in the metric can be written as A pi G, C4, uh, this one here. Uh, D, uh, so the effective, oh, this, <laughs> the surviving Spanish words, this is on the gravitational, gravitational wave. So the gravitational wave effective tensor, which is this. And so the, the gravitational wave effective tensor then is uh, proportional to the second order now, uh, Einstein tensor. We can make it a gauge invariant and calculate an average uh, uh, and perform an integration over these two terms because it's a second order uh, Ricci, uh, so second order in the metric and, and the curvature, uh, scalar curvature. And um, so at, at the end, we're going to have that uh, the volume is much uh, larger than the length scale of the wavelength. So we're going to use then, of course, uh, this equation for the Ricci tensor. We're going to keep quadratic terms in H alpha beta. We're going to work in the harmonic coordinates in the TG gauge where these equations uh, are satisfied. And we're going to neglect these uh, orders uh, because it will be relevant only at the boundary of where we are studying the phenomenon. We're going to get, uh, uh, we're going to use that to satisfy the wave equation. And what we get is a defective, then gravitational wave tensor is proportional to the average of these two quantities. So the, this derivative uh, of, uh, of the metric to first order. And if we consider a plane wave where the metric in the transverse uh, traceless case is given by this, then we can write it like this, and the components are going to be given by this. 0, 0, 0, 3, 3, 0, 3, 3 are equal and equal to this. All the other components are going to be 0 because, you know, the, the fact that this metric only is x, y, 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 and, and, and X, Y, and symmetric. So for a monochromatic plane wave moving in the Z direction with frequency omega, we get that uh, the uh, metric 
that gives uh, gravitational wave perturbation is given by this. We're going to take a time average over several cycles. So essentially, this quantity is going to be one half. And what we get then is that uh, the energy that we can associate with the gravitational wave is proportional to the frequency of the gravitational wave less the square of the amplitudes of the plus and cross polarization. So this, this is the most general result about uh, the energy carried by uh, a wave. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, what is that I'm going to be talking about? Oh, okay. So regarding the gravitational radiation production, um, if we look at Einstein equations, um, the perturbation with a reverse traceless metric uh, in harmonic coordinates, we're going to get this equation plus order h squared. And um, we can write this. And we can take the divergence, and the box is, is, is the wave operator now in flat space time. And we can uh, calculate this integral for h. And essentially, what we're going to, I, I want to do is reproduce the, uh, the quadrupolar formula, but uh, now I'm making some explicit assumptions. So this is the far zone. and. Uh, and we can write the um, uh, uh, inertia tensor, the quadrupolar uh, distribution of matter this way. We assume that the wavelength is much larger than the source size, but uh, much smaller than the distance to the observer. We're going to use the slow motion approximation. Uh, we get the solution. So this uh, is uh, the metric in terms of the acceleration of the quadrupolar distribution of matter that we already saw before. What we're going to do a little bit different now is we're going to use a projection tensor, the transverse projection operator, and uh, we're going to write the quadrupolar momentum this way. And what we have in the near zone is where, again, R is much at the distance, uh, yeah, the size of the, um, of the system it's much smaller the distance to the surface, but it, it, is, it itself is much smaller than the wavelength. So like in a binary system, um, we're going to look at essentially a potential uh, that is going to be given in these terms. We can write it using the result from before like this. We can ignore this, which are uh, internal uh, stress uh, and we assume lower than density, and doing an expansion of the potential, we get it in terms of the monopolar moment, dipolar moment, and the quadrupolar moment for the potential. So in the wave zone, then, this is the result that we have for uh, the metric is proportional to um, the quadrupolar uh, acceleration in the transverse trellis gauge, which is a function of the retarded coordinates. So it, it, this is pretty much the same as showed yesterday, but in, in, in a little bit more rigorous terms. Now, if we want to look at order the magnitude of this source of gravity, um, you know, for where m is the mass of the system, r is the system size, and r is the distance to the observer, uh, let's look at the typical rotation inertia mr square. Then the second time derivative uh, is, is going to be given by this. Let's assume non sphericity which means uh, the kinetic energy coming from the non sphericity is going to be given like this. If it was perfectly spherical, then nothing happens. Um, or we can use the Virial theorem that says that twice the average kinetic energy is proportional to the potential energy. And we can write it like this, where the external component of the potential is GM over R, and the internal is GM divided by uh, capital R. And if we think now 
uh, in terms of a bar that has mass n, typical size given by its length l, and is spinning with angular frequency omega. Put it here. Assume one kilogram mass, one meter for the length, one hertz for the spinning. So the gravitational wave is going to have an amplitude, a strain of 10 to the minus 53. So obviously it's not a lab phenomenon. Now, luminosity of the wave. Um, in, you know, in the very first results, one of the most amazing, the first results, uh, the, the famous PRL paper that presents uh, the detection of the merger of two uh, black holes that were pretty massive. Um, you know, the different parameters that were given with the masses of the object, the mass of the final um, merged object, the energy uh, that was lost as gravitational waves, which essentially is giving the luminosity of the phenomenon. And remember that luminosity, it was a monster number. So the luminosity then we can be calculated as the flux, PE transversing an area differential of A in a sphere of radius R surrounding the source in a time differential of T. So differential of E uh, divided by differential of T differential of A. This is going to be the T0, 3 component, which is equal to the minus T0, 0 component divided by C of the gravitational wave effective tensor. And this is, is equal to this. And essentially, the final formula is that the energy radiated uh, in, in an instant differential of T within uh, a solid angle of differential of omega. It's given by this expression. Notice that there are three dots here, so the third derivative of um, this quantity. And um, well, we can calculate this in, in terms of uh, the quantities that that we put here before, and the gravitational wave luminosity then is going to be given by this expression. So order of magnitude of luminosity. If m we have mass m, size r, the motion time scale of the order of t, then uh, the third time the radio is, is of the order of uh, non-spherical kinetic energy of the object divided by t, so essentially, the uh, luminosity is going to be given, uh, it's going to be proportional to uh, the non-spherical kinetic energy of the object divided by the time scale squared, divided by C phi and T. So in, in, in browser gra where gravity is dominating uh, the dynamics, and we can think that the time scale is of the order of the typical velocity of the non sphericity and uh, of the size of, of the object. So it's going to be given by this expression. And uh, if we have a bar, one meter, one kilogram, and spinning one hertz, so the luminosity is essentially 10 to the minus 53 watts. Um, and for systems where now the typical velocity is uh, speed of light, where the radius is like uh, like the Schwarz radius, and uh, calculating this system in equilibrium, uh, we get the luminosity for binary system is uh, that is spinning at 10% of the speed of light, essentially is 10 to the 42 watts. So that's a lot of power. So what changes the thing is now the fact that involves compact objects. So let me talk a little bit about radiation reaction. How many slides I got? 438. OK, so about half away. Well, uh, radiation reaction is it's a very important, how many slides on radiation reaction? Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to need some of the results, so let, let's go through it. So only two, three slides. So gravitational wave generation, it's going to take energy from the system, so that means that the system needs to react to this loss, and so effectively then you conserve energy. And so the forces that the body experiences by a result of its own field is called the self force. Calculating self force is difficult. And uh, one interesting thing, think in, in these terms, that the self force is going to accelerate more massive bodies more. But um, we still going to have the equivalence principle. The body is still going to move along the geodesic of space time, including the own gravitational field. So the idea is to search for radiation reaction potential that conserves energy in weak gravitational fields with the slow motion of the sources. We're going to call this uh, FRR, so the radiation reaction force, and mass per form work such is equal to minus the power radiating gravitational waves. So performing an integral like this for the radiation reaction force has to be equal precisely to the energy, so minus the energy that's been lost by the system. So we integrate over several cycles, and we integrate by part twice, we neglect border terms, so we get this uh, result. And for a point like particle, uh, which is going to have a quadrupolar tensor that is of this form, then the um, integral of the radiation reaction force is going to be like this, and uh, which is proportional to this the fifth derivative here, and if the radiation reaction force is minus a given uh, potential of radiation reaction, uh, then we can infer that the shape of this uh, um, radiation reaction potential is going to be given by the fifth derivative of um, the quadrupolar distribution of mass times uh, the coordinates. So, angular momentum. If we use that force now to calculate the, ang the loss of angular momentum generated, it's going to have to be given by this expression. And then the change in angular momentum is going to be given by this integral, where we use the expression from the previous slide for the reaction force. We integrate over several cycles, then twice by parts, and we get this result for uh, the, the change in, in angular momentum where this is essentially uh, the quadrupolar distribution of mass. Now, the idea is to apply this result at um, an ellipsoid. So this is one of the potential sources. Uh, we know uh, a lot of pulsars in the galaxy, and we know their position. We know their uh, angular velocity because we, we calculate their spin. And uh, the angular, uh, uh, the frequency of the gravitational wave is going to be twice the angular velocity of these objects. So knowing the position and knowing at which uh, gravitational wave you search, this is a type of continuous wave. It's not a burst. So it's you can integrate over time which increases the signal-to-noise ratio. And so that's an interesting source to search for. It, it, has, it requires a lot of computational effort, but not much more manpower than that. And um, so let's look at the possibility that these pulsars, these neutron stars, uh, are emitting gravitational waves. What, what characteristic uh, strain would they have? those gravitational waves. So we're going to look at an ellipsoidal object that it rotates around an S axis uh, uh, X3, which is the principal inertia axis. We assume that then the inertia uh, is diagonalized and uh, it spins with uh, angular velocity omega. And then at time t, we're going to get that i is given then by this expression. And we can uh, now uh, just uh, have it uh, rotating and uh, just performing this standard calculation here. We're going to have taken the 
second time derivative this result and um, assuming that uh, the metric is zero trace and transversal then hij is going to be given by this expression so the plus polarization is going to be given by this the cross polarization is going to be given by the sign notice that the twice the angular uh, frequency the angular yeah the angular rotation frequency of the pulsar happens to be the frequency of the gravitational wave so we derive once again we get this result and we get that this quantity is constant so the luminosity is proportional to this quantity and notice that it's essentially proportional to ellipticity it's ellipticity so how much fails to be a sphere is zero so it's a perfect sphere then zero radiation similarly for the angular momentum um, so the angular momentum due to gravitational waves is going to be proportional to this result so now what is the polarization for an observer outside the z-axis so what we're going to do now is make an angle i from the direction in which the wave travels to the direction of the observer which is what in reality most of the time is going to happen with observations and um, we do a projection with this this is a rotation uh, matrix and the inverse for an angle i which is going to be given by this and uh, we do this then the transversal projection e and i happen to be proportional to this notice that it's trace free because this term is zero and we get uh, that the trace is equal to this and the second time derivative of the quadrupolar distribution is just proportional to this rotational uh, axis value and times this which means that the metric perturbation is like this which we can extract from there then the strain plus and the strain cross which are proportional to this notice and now we have an angle that indicates the, the projection so there's a diminishing with a, a straight uh, zero angle line of sight so if uh, i is zero or i is pi then we're going to have a circular polarized if i is pi over two so only the plus polarization is going to survive so if i1 is equal to i2 because it could be further deformed the object then we have that uh, the electricity is zero and it's no radiation and uh, if we want to think about a point particle um, to do even a somehow simpler calculation you know just a particle that is spinning with angular uh, velocity omega around an axis uh, we can enter these values and let's assume so the uh, luminosity in gravitational waves is proportional to these numbers let's think that this is the earth if we make this the earth the angular uh, velocity is given by this in seconds which is the time it takes to the speed at which it goes around the sun so assume it's almost circular orbit and the mass of the earth is given by this so the luminosity is just 196 watts um, now more interesting example is what is what if if you know we know that uh, the crab pulsar which is, is a very well known and young pulsar in our galaxy not far from us what if it was um, uh, losing energy because it's emitting gravitational waves well for one thing we do know that pulsars lose energy because it's uh, inherent to electromagnetic processes that are going through you know they have a strong magnetic fields when they're young then they are dying out because they're emitting electromagnetic waves so losing energy and what happens is they're slowing down as they slow down the phenomenon is called a spin down so there's a spin down that is measurable 
what we're going to do is assume that what if there was no electromagnetic energy loss and the whole spin down was produced by gravitational wave emission. So that it's a way of putting an upper limit on gravitational wave emission from the, from the pulsar. So the observed physical parameters are these, the period is um, 33 milliseconds. The spin down, so the rate at which the period is changing, is uh, 4.21, 10 to the minus 13. The mass is 1.4 uh, solar mass, radius of about 10 kilometers. Um, then the quadrupole associated is essentially two fifths of uh, mR square, you know, almost a sphere. So it's given by this value. The inclination axis is 62 degrees. You know, we know the direction of x is a spin, and we know where it is. So the distance is 2.5 kiloparsecs, so we're back here. And uh, then the spin down, uh, if it was due to uh, gravitational waves, which here put it uh, in Spanish, and 100% as I mentioned, and of course we know it's not, then the elasticity would be, um, well, this is just the, the torque multiplying times the change in angular velocity, but essentially uh, the rate of change in, 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 in angular frequency is going to be proportional to this. And uh, the, the, the spin down proportional to this. We solve for the elasticity and uh, assume that, you know, this is what was causing this. If, if this was the elasticity of the pulsar and it's the maximum it could have, assuming that it was all, all, all the energy was lost due to the elasticity, and I mentioned the gravitational waves, then we get that um, the amplitude of the plus and cloud polarization proportional to the 10 to the minus. Actually, um, This is stop work. I know it's working now, but I don't think it's going to work for too long. Well, I try to speak louder anyway. So, um, actually, one of the first upper limit was calculated by um, LIGO in its initial phase uh, during the the design sensitivity campaign that was S5, uh, it, was, it was an upper limit that was put on the mission of gravitational waves that was constraining this uh, to much lower, uh, this number, to much lower elasticity because we know that otherwise it would have detected the gravitational waves that were coming. So it was a way of beating down this uh, uh, rather large estimate. So binary systems um, now. So let's suppose that we have a binary system and the bodies are in X1, X2 plane. The angular momentum points along the X3 axis, so the spin in the X1, X2 plane. So A is R1 plus R2. These are the masses. Um, these are the reduced uh, masses, M1 over M2 of the system. And uh, so the different components of the quadrupolar distribution of mass are, are, are given by this. And uh, the orbital phase is going to be given by this, uh, where omega is, is the frequency, the, the comparison frequency, essentially. And we can compute the metric and put an observator distance r from the Z axis, this is the metric that we get. So essentially, the plus polarization is uh, twice, uh, the cosine of twice uh, the orbital frequency, and times A, remember that was, uh, 2A was the distance between the object, angular frequency, the distance to the observer. If we use that 
uh, D is A times omega to eliminate A and omega, then using uh, the third Keplerian law, and uh, M omega is uh, V3, then we get the V is this, and which essentially V is square root of G and A. a. So in terms of V, this is what we get, and the phase is, is a uh, frequency times T. And if I want to serve it at an angle I, now we do the same that we did for the pulsar. This is what we're going to get. And what we get is that the wave is monochromatic and double the orbital frequency. Now, monochromatic with a grain of salt. Because we know that as the gravitational wave is, is produced, the system is losing energy, which means all the parameters are changing, which means that uh, there's going to be an orbit decay and then the frequency is going to change. So essentially, the frequency is going to be slowly uh, increasing as well as the amplitude. So these are uh, the terms. The luminosity is uh, given by this expression, where uh, eta is the symmetric mass ratio, and the energy law from the system comes from the orbital energy, which, of course, is given by this. And uh, we can write it in these terms. And uh, gravitational wave luminosity, which is this derivative, can be computed here. And we can compute the time to coalescence. So plugging in all the different values, uh, then we get this uh, expression for the time to coalescence, mm -hmm. where this is the frequency, and this is the mass of the objects, and of course we know that it's going to be a phase evolution because the gravitational wave will not be monochromatic and the phase will not increase uniformly with time. We're going to need an uh, energy function and the flux uh, there. And so this is the, the way the phase evolves, and these are the final plus and cross polarization, and uh, as the orbit decays, the frequency of the gravitational wave increases as well as the amplitude. So this quantity is, uh, well, this is like a chirp, and, and if, if we look at um, this quantity and the flux, essentially using uh, that, uh, T uh, as, as a function of V when uh, V over C goes to infinity because V is small, um, then we get this Tc minus this value. The angular evolution is given by this expression. And due to this, the frequency is proportional to these quantities. And the time evolution of the frequency then is going to be expressed by this. Now, if we define this capital M, like eta, remember that was the reduced uh, proportional to the masses, uh, three-fifths of, of the mass, which is essentially uh, these values of the mass, which is essentially this quantity, uh, the mass of one of the uh, members of the binary system mass times the mass of the other to the power of three-fifths divided by at one fifth the sum of the masses. Then the variation of the frequency is going to be given essentially by the frequency of the system itself and the chirp mass. So this is the chirp mass that is a very important quantity and includes information about the variation of the frequency. That's the reason why I learned yesterday that with the bars, because you cannot look at the frequency evolution, you cannot get the chirp. And um, so that's a problem with narrow band detectors. You, you need to get uh, a good chunk of the wave, several cycles in the band of your detector to be able to uh, see the evolution and infer this. So, well, I already said why it's important. And uh, so we can work out a little bit more these quantities, but essentially, if we apply all this 
results to the uh, binary pulsar 1913 plus 16, uh, the one that holds and Taylor studied for so long and got the Nobel Prize. These are the values of the masses. This uh, is the period uh, in days. This is uh, the rate of change, minus the rate of change. And so we plug in all these parameters and we get that the, the change of the period is 2.4 uh, times 10 to the minus 12. So this is the decay of the orbit, how the period is increasing. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is, this prediction is ac actually what it was almost measured to an extreme, extreme low uh, difference. 10 minutes. Can I use 10 minutes for cosmology? I think this was, uh, it's, excuse me? Oh, Odilio's chair, you're the chair. So chair, do I have permission to cover cosmology? Okay. Uh, so we already saw the continuous emissions from, uh, you know, departures one way or another from ellipticity, either because they have vibration or mode, or ellipticity in a neutral star. We saw the binary system, and this is true for uh, black holes and uh, two black holes, black hole, neutral star, and neutral stars. I, you know, again, a word of caution, it's extremely important to extract a lot of the information to use templates. And in order to use templates, you need much more than this. You need actually the evolution, and that only can be done using methods like post-Newtonian expansion and numerical relativity. That's for the binary system. Now, uh, the cosmological gravitational waves, as I mentioned, could be extremely important on giving us much better information about the origin of a universe and the cosmic microwave background experience. So let's assume a Freeman Robertson Walker metric that is of this shape. Mm -hmm. And essentially, this actually is, is only one case, the, the, the case that it corresponds to uh, um, uh, uh, zero curvature, so it's flat space time. And um, we assume that this metric is a solution of this energy momentum tensor, which is a, it's just a general fluid, uh, which typically has equation of state where P is a function of the density. So it's density plus the pressure, uh, the forward velocity of the fluid, the pressure, the metric. So uh, this function, which is the only relevant function in the metric, satisfies the Freeman's equations. A dot over, so the, the, the time derivative of A squared proportional to density, and the acceleration is proportional to rho plus three times the pressure divided by C squared. And um, we can change to another time that is called conformal time. In that case, the differential of T becomes A times the differential of eta. Eta, again, throughout the next slice is going to be the um, conformal time. So if the universe is matter dominated, uh, for example, like P is equal to zero, which is a dust. You know, we assume a dust essentially think that each galaxy in the universe is, is, is pickle of dust and it's not interacting with any of the other galaxies, so zero pressure. That's, that's a simplistic model, but works pretty well. So in that case, if you solve the equations in terms of the time, it's the solution is two-thirds of t. And in terms of the conformal time, just the square of t. If the universe is radiation dominated, you know, photon gas, third of the density, then uh, we get that the radius is proportional to the square root of the time. In terms of the conformal time, it's linear with the conformal time. So. Um, So if we have uh, inflationary cosmology due, for example, to um, lambda factor, cosmological constant lambda, then 
the radius of the universe behaves like the exponential of h times t minus t0, where h is related to the derivative of a over a. And um, p, uh, the pressure is minus uh, rho c squared. That's the constant. So this term, if, if, if you pick up, if you think that the energy momentum tensor, you have a fluid with equations of a state where the pressure is equal to the minus energy density, this is the same as the cosmological constant. So that's the reason why I wrote this here. So where P is minus the energy density. So uh, and in terms of the conformal time, it's one minus H times eta minus eta zero. Now we can consider the metric uh, with the perturbation now. Mm? So it's the Freeman reverse of worker, but now we think, well, in this background, we, there is a perturbation. And uh, we're going to use that uh, uh, H. So the, the gauge uh, is the transverse traceless gauge. The, the trace is null, and uh, if we calculate it, this is the way we get it. So um, then the equation that uh, it's going to obey um, is going to be an equation like this in the Lorentz gauge. Notice the energy momentum tensor uh, here, and we're going to have to choose. So if we choose an energy momentum tensor like this, but we incorporate now these factors, and this is, is some anisotropy. So this is a purely spatial tensor that represents some anisotropy in, in the distribution of the perturbation. So <coughs> the transverse traceless projection is going to be the source of the gravitational wave. It contains the perturbations up to second order in H. So we're going to get then that one of the radius of the universe squared times the Laplacian of the metric times all these quantities, so this is the equation from the slide before, is essentially now uh, equal to uh, or, or proportional to this surviving term from here. And uh, we can go into a conformal H, which essentially is going to be given by this. And uh, then the Laplacian is going to be given by this, and the Freeman Roberts of Walker conformal metric can be written in this form and remember that's a conformal time and uh, then uh, the metric is going to become this the wave equation is going to be given by these terms and notice now that there is a damping term here which we can ignore is the variation with the conformal time of the metric a much larger than the logarithmic variation of the radius of the universe with this conformal time. So when the frequency of the gravitational wave is greater than h, which is essentially the logarithmic derivative of the radius of the universe, the cobalt parameter, so if this is a dot over a. So then we can ignore the term. We can look at waves that are comparable to the curvature scale single polarization along z with the projection tensor now equal to zero. If h i j can be written like this, and uh, where uh, u can be written in, in, in these terms, uh, omega hat is essentially c k, where k is the wave vector, and uh, when this frequency, a conformal frequency, is much larger than uh, the logarithmic uh, derivative the second, no, sorry, the second derivative of A respect to the conformal time divided by conformal time, then the solutions are going to be of the form U equal to E I omega eta. So we're going to call effective potential this time. 1 over A, the second it's the second derivative of A respect to the conformal time. Um, so if the conformal frequency is much smaller 
than the effective potential, then we see from uh, the previous equation that the size of the perturbation will grow with time. If the conformal frequency is of the order of the effective potential, then what we get is the effective potential, which is like this, can be written in terms of this equation, where this is the Hubble parameter, and uh, this is um, uh, P over rho, and this has, depending on the relationship between P and rho, three possible solutions. If P is one-third uh, of rho C squared, obviously you get a one here, this is zero. So the effective potential becomes zero when we have radiation, dominated universe. If we have a dust dominated universe, then essentially it's half the square of the Hubble parameter. But if we have dark energy, remember the pressure is minus energy density, we had twice the square of the Hubble parameter. So the summary of all this is that wave we frequently than the Hubble parameter, much smaller than the size of the universe, um, are unaffected by the potential, the effective potential. Why? The frequencies that are much smaller than the Hubble parameter are. If we assume P equal to uh, one third of rho, the effective potential is zero, we already saw it. And, but an interesting case is the following. If we have a small effective potential that grows for some time, and then it becomes small again, then when the gravitational wave encounters it, they're going to be amplified. So if the effective potential is much larger than uh, the square of the conformal frequency, there is a solution for you, uh, you of the conformal time, that is proportional to uh, the radius of the universe, approximately. If the waves inside the horizon with a frequency larger than the Hubble parameter encounter a growing effective potential, then they can leave the horizon and with uh, a frequency lower than uh, H when the universe has a factor A1. But at a later time, if the effective potential decays, goes back, uh, then uh, where the frequencies are much larger than H, again, uh, a time when the scale factor is let's call it A2, different from A1, then what we're going to have essentially is that U2 over U1 is proportional to A, A2 over A1. So the idea is to consider universe having an epoch of dark energy dominated inflation that begins at A1 and ends at A2. Then the radiation dominates, so the effective potential becomes zero. So during inflation, uh, we can think that uh, the Hubble parameter is the Hubble parameter of inflation. It's constant. Uh, we take it equal to this. Then the effective potential is this, which is equal to this. Then the size will be determined by the conformal frequency, which is given by this, where is this is the edge of inflation. And then at the end of inflation, we're going to have that relationship uh, that we already assume as possible. So at that point, it becomes suddenly radiation dominated, and the effective potential is going to go to zero. It's going to grow with a mode. Um, the, the mode, the growing mode, is going to have u equal to u one a over a one, and we're going to need to match it to an oscillating mode u over u one that is going to be given by this. I, the sine of the uh, conformal frequency times uh, this. Uh, conform time at the particular value uh, two and plus theta uh, times the cosine. So continuity is going to require that A is equal A2 of A1 and that way we can find the parameter beta to do the matching and so the first derivative is going to require that theta is equal to the conformal frequency times this uh, to the minus one times the conformal derivative for A2 you know, the size of the universe at that second time, which is going to be proportional to H over A1, and that's much larger than A. So during inflation, 
the scale factor increases by 10 to the 27. Mm. Pretty much all theories of inflation assume this. So uh, it's going to launch into sinusoid with almost zero phase. So beta is going to describe the amplification factor. If we use a present date uh, A0 and a frequency that uh, is equal to then the uh, conformal frequency divided by A0, we're going to get a beta that is equal to this value. During the radiation dominated era, A is going to be proportional to uh, the square root of the, of the time. So the Hubble parameter at the time of inflation times A2 squared is going to be equal to H0, the Hubble constant, times A0 squared. So this is a value in principle um, up to the radiation dominated era. So we're doing a little bit of an extrapolation to take in its value uh, up to the mother dominated area. But uh, we're going to have the beta is uh, proportional to um, uh, Hubble parameter inflation times the Hubble constant divided by the angular frequency. Well, so let's suppose that the pre-inflation era had a Planck scale fluctuations in the metric perturbation. Then the energy density in between omega and omega plus differential of omega is going to be given by this. Mm. And so this is the density energy in gravitational waves per unit of gravitational waves. And it's proportional to the third power of the uh, gravitational, uh, well, the angular frequency. And this is going to be amplified by a factor beta. That means that the logarithmic director per uh, unit of frequency of the uh, energy density in gravitational waves is going to be proportional to this. And notice that now when you do this, that doesn't depend on, on this, so um, it's flat. It's a, it's a flat spectrum. So from the first Freeman equation, we know that uh, 1 over A uh, times the derivative uh, of A all square is equal to proportional to energy density, which is the same as saying that the Hubble parameter is equal to the pr proportional to density. So from here, we get that um, the Hubble parameter at the time of inflation is proportional to the energy density at the time of inflation. And um, H0, so the Hubble constant now, is itself proportional to uh, current density or we take it to be the required density to close the universe. And we define then the gravitational wave energy spectrum to be the fraction of energy density to gravitational waves in a logarithmic frequency interval compared to the total energy density in the universe. This is the quantity that people do in stochastic searches with LIGO and Virgo um, quote when they give the result. So the ratio in uh, uh, gravitational um, wave uh, uh, gravitational waves density, which is given by this, is proportional to uh, the density of the time of inflation. So essentially, is the energy uh, energy scale of inflation over the Planck energy scale. So one thing that we can assume that energy density of inflation, at least according to most theories, the granulification theory, the granulification of the electroweak uh, 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 force with uh, strong interactions um, is of the order um, of 10 to the 16 GeVs, which is what we're going to put in here. But essentially, the density inflation time is the fourth power of the energy scale divided by uh, speed of light and the Planck constant, which means, and, and on the other hand, and only on the other hand, the Planck energy is just 2 times 10 to the 19 uh, giga electron volts. It's naturally defined by the Planck constant in this quantity. And so that means that we have that the energy, um, scale energy of inflation is 10 to 16 GeVs. Um, the time, uh, the scale energy of uh, of 
Planck is 10 to the 19 uh, GeV, this is to the power of 4, so it becomes essentially the density is of the order 10 to the minus 12. Now, we, one thing that we didn't take into consideration is uh, when the matter dominated air occurred, because we took it only up to uh, the radiation dominated air. If we add this, uh, the redshift that corresponds to this, which is about 3,000, then um, with the uh, scale factor that, that we had to uh, take into consideration, then essentially all we have to do is multiply by 1 over uh, 1 plus the redshift, and then the value is going to be 10 to the minus 15. Um, so 